In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the United States annexation of the islands of Hawaii. And the first European presence in Hawaii, which you can see on this map circle right there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, was established by James Cook back in 1778. While the American Revolution is going on, this English explorer, James Cook, establishes uh, European influence in the region. And he actually calls them the Sandwich Islands which way back in the day I used to think were they just known for amazing sandwiches but it actually comes from the fact he was naming them in honor of this guy who was the Earl of Sandwich which was a town over in England so the first Americans to actually come into the Hawaiian Islands and keep in mind there are already people there the indigenous people of Hawaii are already living on these islands were coming for ideological reasons and you get all these people coming in, um, especially in the 1820s, coming into the islands of Hawaii as missionaries. And they're coming into Hawaii in the 1820s, and their whole reason for coming was to convert the native people who had their own native religions to Christianity. They're going there for these, you know, spiritual missions. Um, and you can see in this image right here, you have this religious kind of school being taught by these native Hawaiian trees with the native Hawaiian people listening. And so these missionaries come in and they're the first real American presence, but they're not being sent by the U.S. government or anything like that. They're there for their various churches, Methodists, for example. But you also have some economic reasons why Hawaii starts being noticed. Uh, these missionaries stay and they have children and, and for some of them they start realizing that Hawaii has economic potential to make money. Hey, we want to get paid. And in the 1860s, you have these Americans who are there. Some of them are the, the, the sons and the daughters of the American missionaries of the 1820s. Others are new Americans who have arrived. And they start realizing that you could grow things in Hawaii that you can't grow easily or in many cases anywhere in the continental United States. We're talking things like sugar and pineapple plantations. And they start buying up this land. And that land, which previously was you know, for the Hawaiian people, starts getting bought up. And they start growing things like you see in this image right here, sugar. And sugar cane and sugar plantations start springing up and owned in the hands of a very few white Americans. Um, you also have pineapple plantations being uh, bought up as well. And you have some very famous names appear following this period in the 1860s. Um, one of the things that was a problem was because Hawaii wasn't a part of the United States, there were tariffs, which are taxes on trade being brought into the United States. So anything that was grown in Hawaii, the sugar, the pineapples, was subject to a tariff, a tax, which made it more expensive for people in the United States. So there began to be this kind of real thought, what if Hawaii was a part of the USA? You would not have to pay the tariff then. So you have people appearing, and one of them is this guy with the awesome beard, Sanford Dole. And Sanford Dole becomes one of the leaders, the American leaders of Hawaii, and he starts doing things to limit the, right, the rights of the Hawaiian people, making it difficult for them to vote, making it difficult for them to make decisions within the government. Sanford Dole also happens to be the cousin of this guy, James Dole. James Dole, without the awesome beard, though, becomes the founder of one of the companies that is still around today, Dole Plantations. Dole becomes, of course, you know, making fruit cups, making pineapple. You'll see the labels all still in the supermarkets today. Dole, the company, survives. And these men become the economic leaders of Hawaii. There's also political motives going on here. And the political motives come from the fact that there were people within the United States who were really worried that if the United States did not take over Hawaii, that perhaps another country would do so. Perhaps Japan, for example. Here you have this political cartoon kind of showing Japan's ambition is somehow going to 
take over Hawaii if America doesn't, or perhaps England, or some other country. So America's looking at this situation, and they start feeling this sense of, like, let's act first. Let's preemptively take over Hawaii before one of these other countries, perhaps England, perhaps Japan, as in, you could see once again in this political cartoon, the United States hovering over with the big fork, getting ready to eat Hawaii. Now, here's what happens. There's also strategic reasons. And many Americans, in fact, in 1887, the planters, the plantation owners of Hawaii, the Americans in Hawaii, get a treaty signed which gives the U.S. full rights of a naval base at a place called Pearl Harbor. And remember, there was that guy, Alfred T. Mahan, who in the 1890s was talking about that if America wants to be a world power, they need to have a powerful... A powerful navy. So in 1887, they actually get a treaty that allows the United States to build a naval base at Pearl Harbor. So you have strategic reasons. And if you look at, again at the map, you can see Hawaii strategically is important. It's a halfway point towards Asia. So a refueling station, supplies, put military bases, trade, all sorts of things. Sky's the limit here. Now there's a problem. And the problem actually is the indigenous people of Hawaii. And they're not a problem in the sense of problems for Hawaii. They're a problem for the U.S. plans for Hawaii. And you get one individual... The queen at the time, Queen Lilikalani. Queen Lilikalani, here she is sitting next to, there's the queen, there's Sanford Dole. Queen Lilikalani is really worried about the fact that her island is being exploited by people who are not native to the islands. And so she starts mobilizing support for this movement where basically it's Hawaii for the Hawaiians. Self-rule, self-government less foreign influence over this region. Um, here's a speech from her. That's not what she said, but that's the sentiment of her writings and her speeches, and it's basically Hawaii for the Hawaiians. Um, so Sisha starts organizing, you know, this movement to try to great, gain greater authority for the Hawaiian people. Well, U.S. business interests in Hawaii decide they view her as this. They view her as uncivilized. They dehumanize her in the writings and the political cartoons. They blame her government for scandals and corruption. And basically what happens next is one of those things that is probably not one of our be better moments in American history. Queen of the Kalani is overthrown. Eighteen ninety three American businesses back in uprising. They overthrow Queen Lila Kalani. She's removed from power. A Republic is set up, a constitution is created in 1894, Hawaii is turned into a republic, uh, we do not annex it, we do not take it over right away, the president at the time in 1894 is Grover Cleveland, he doesn't want to annex it, he's worried about whether or not this is legitimate, whether or not the Hawaiians actually want it to be annexed, so he doesn't really bring up the issue in terms of before Congress, but in 1898, President McKinley will formally annex Hawaii into U.S. territory. And uh, I'll leave this lecture with a quote by Mark Twain. And he said, The traders brought labor and fancy diseases, in other words, long, deliberate, and fallible, and fallible destruction. And the missionaries brought the means of grace and got the islanders ready. So the two forces are working together harmoniously so the islands will be in the hands of the whites. And read more about Hawaii in the book, but that is the end of today's lecture.